a virtual speaker series again with our great pal, David Paleologos. Um, David, I think this is the fifth time you and I have had an opportunity to talk in various political cycles, election year cycles, and it's great to have you back. Before we get to the introduction of, of David, who I think probably needs no introduction because most of you on, you know, on the program today have a sense of him. I, I will tell you that this is um, for 10 years running uh, a, a speaker series, which is co-sponsored by the Boston Harbor Hotel and O'Neill and Associates. And this year, we're joined by Seven Letter, a robust national public relations and social uh, social uh, public relations firm. Um, it, I'm proud to have them on board and joining us for the first time. So it's it's great to have them. All the folks from Seven Letter. Um, we, we are missing David, uh, we're, we're, we're missing Stephen Johnson, who was a sponsor, uh, spokesperson. He's the general manager of the Boston Harbor Hotel. So I want to tip my hat to him and, and to the hotel management team and simply say, you're, you've been there for 10 years with us and we really deeply appreciate it. You know, we're five days away from the election, 120 odd hours away from an election probably 130 hours away from knowing who the next president of the United States is going to be. Uh, David uh, Paleologos is, is somebody who, as I had said earlier, we've, we've had opportunities to talk to in, in various political electoral, electoral cycles. Um, I, I'm dying to hear your final insights. I know you've just come in from a national, uh, a national poll being conducted by, your, by you and your firm. But I also want to talk about the fact that you're the director of the Suffolk University Political Research Center. And um, you have done over the years, uh, put together the bellwether model uh, at Suffolk, which is designed to predict outcomes. Um, and, and not just the simple majorities or, or margins of victories that people are going to have come Tuesday or any election day. I, I'd love for you to get into that. But before you do, I, I want to tell the audience again that Nate Silver, who was perhaps the, the best known pollster outside of, of David in this country, does a ranking of all pollsters in the country. And he holds David and his firm in the top one percentile for accuracy and for, and for being correct. Um, David, it's great to call you a friend and it's wonderful to have you back. What are your insights? What are your thoughts about this coming election on Tuesday? Well, thank you. It's great to be back and, and kudos to you uh, Tom and the Boston Harbor Hotel and uh, and Seven Letter. That's a that's a terrific addition to your speaker series. So congratulations with that. My insights are um, twofold. Number one, most of the questions I get asked at this point are questions like how reliable are the polls, and then two, we get into the polls. So I'll start in reverse order and tell you a little bit about the poll we released this morning. We did a four-way ballot test nationally with USA Today, the ballot test showed a seven point lead, 50 to 43, it was actually 49.5, but we reported it as a 50 to 43 lead. And when pressed, the, uh, when the undecideds and third parties were pressed to pick one of two, the lead expanded from 50, 43 to 52, 44, an eight point lead. This is unprecedented at this time. As you recall, in 2016, Hillary Clinton was only leading by three points in the national polls. And the national polls weren't wrong. She won by two in the popular vote. So our poll pretty much reflects more or less the aggregate average of national polls to this date. Again, polls being a snapshot in time, showing Joe Biden comfortably ahead. And so when you, in your poll, we, we talked earlier, in your poll, you, you show a very different candidate in Joe Biden than we had in, in 2016. You, you see a virus, COVID-19, which was not here in 2016. And you, you mentioned something that was somewhat frightening to me that, that I, I wish you'd kind of expand on. And that's the fear of violence that people have that you measured in the poll. Yeah, so I wrote a column today, and you can check it out on USA Today Online. Um, and I did mention the poll numbers between Trump and Biden, but I spoke about the one statistic that everyone agrees on, which is that three out of four likely national voters, three out of four are saying they are very or somewhat concerned about violence 
on election day or thereafter. Think about that. Three out of four, that's Democrats and Republicans. It's whites and non-whites. It's old and young. And I, I concluded in my column that how ironic that the one statistic that merges the differing realities between the CNN, Joe Biden, COVID-19 reality and the Donald Trump, Fox News, uh, I'm personally better off reality is this common statistic of fear. And if the race is close and the, there are some indications that it, it, there are some states where it's getting closer, you could have the race end up with litigators and lawyers and in the courts and that would have a profound impact on the stock market and those people who look at the investment community with a keen eye. So let's talk about that. Uh, when do you think this race gets called? Is it Tuesday? A week from Tuesday? A month from Tuesday? <clears throat> Ironically, I think Tuesday night is the, will be the best and final night that Donald Trump will be, uh, will be looking at. Uh, he, will, he may go to bed Tuesday night ahead, Donald Trump. Um, and his supporters are going to go to bed Tuesday night ahead because Michigan and a lot of the battleground states do not count mail-in ballots prior to election day. So the only people, the first counts that we get from several states are going to be people who vote in person. And we know from the polling, the people who vote from in person are center right. So it's going to give us a different picture if it's close and then People are going to wake up the next day or the following day and the mail-in ballots are going to be counted and then those states are going to flip to Joe Biden. And that potentially is the seeds for chaos and violence. Now, if Joe Biden wins in a landslide and our national poll tends to, tends to be signaling that, it'll be a moot point. Biden will win Florida. He, he may even win states like Georgia, uh, maybe even Ohio or Iowa. Um, and it looks at this point like the former blue all states are, are all lining up for Biden one way or the other. So, so the audience understands what we're talking about. You have often talked about the blue wall, Pennsylvania, Wisconsin, Michigan. Talk a little bit about that and what you see there, because those are states where Trump did very well four years ago. Yeah, I mean, he did well enough to win. Uh, he, he, he outperformed the polls. The polls were a lot closer. And one of, the, one of the factors of 2016 polling wise that a lot of people aren't aware of is that a lot of the top public pollsters did not poll the blue wall states. We didn't, Quinnipiac didn't, Maris didn't. So if you were Nate Silver or Larry Sabato or, or Charlie Cook, and you were promising all year you were gonna forecast the electoral college, you had very limited information in those blue wall states. And so uh, it's, the, it's no knock on any individual pollster, but the caliber of the work and the research wasn't to the level of the major institutional public pollsters. And therein uh, lied the, the problem, the polls were wrong in the blue, uh, the, those uh, blue wall states. And the result was Trump won them all and he went on to win fairly comfortably. You know, it's interesting. Uh, I, we have a lot of people who have asked questions and I'm picking it up on chat. If you have a question, I should have said this earlier. If you have a question, go to Q&A at the bottom of your screen and ask a question or go to chat and ask a question. David, you said something very interesting. You, 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 you assumed, at least I heard this as you were talking, that, 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 he, that Biden is going to win Florida. Florida is an early count state. We're going to know what happens in Florida pretty early. Yeah. The, the, today, um, today, several polls came out showing Biden slightly ahead. Um, that breaks the trend that we saw last week. <clears throat> last week, we saw Trump by one or even. Trump by one, even, uh, you know, when we polled it a few weeks ago, it was even. Um, and I believe it's obviously going to be close. It could be a late night in Florida. Um, but those polls, you know, showing a two point lead, a three point, I don't think there'll be a three point lead, but unless there's a wave uh, election, are showing that this is a real possibility, um, more real than Texas. I mean, Biden has a shot to win Texas too, but Texas is Texas. And, and this is a Florida is a, is a close race. So, you know, I think 
in a race this close, and I talked about this a month ago, Gloria Lariva is a candidate for president on the Florida ballot. Now, people might say, who is Gloria Lariva? Well, Florida has seven candidates for president. Seven, not two, not four. And one of those candidates in Suffolk University, I think was the only, if, if not one of the few, who actually listed all of the candidates on the Florida ballot. Took us, cost us more money, took us more time. But there was a candidate, Gloria Lariva, who got 1% of the vote. Now you may say, well, who is she? She has a, a, an Hispanic name. And under her name on the Florida ballot, it says Socialism and Liberation Party. Socialism and Liberation Party. I went into the cross tabs and I saw that 3% of young voters and 2% of Hispanic voters were voting for her. Now those voters come right off of Biden. Um, so that even a, a pollster who released a poll today or yesterday who might have Biden slightly ahead, if they don't poll all the candidates that are certified on a state ballot, it has an impact. And, you know, it could go to Biden, but then again, with the nature of the ballot and what's going on in Florida, it may not. Let's talk about the youth vote. Youth are voting in greater numbers than they have historically. We, you see it all across America? And what, what effect is it having on this, on this election? I do. Um, it's interesting, the dynamic, because if you had said to me, there's going to be an election and students won't be able to be mobilized on college campuses to get out and vote and to volunteer, who's going to win that election? I would say the Republican, because you need students on college campuses rallying and volunteering and voting and doing registration drives. That's what you have this year with COVID-19. The difference is that Donald Trump, ironically, because he's such a polarizing figure, has, has polarized the election such that it's drawing out younger people who voted for Pete Buttigieg and Bernie Sanders and, and, and uh, Elizabeth Warren even, who were young and uh, and have cast ballots. Now, they may not do it from that origin, from that university campus, but they're doing it from, from their homes. And we're seeing much more engagement by young voters in this election, many of whom have already voted. We have a lot of people asking questions. And so just to kind of follow along with that, with that line of, of your answer. So if it's a close race, uh, what does Trump do? Does he refuse to vacate? Does he challenge the you know, the, the uh, toss up states where the close, the, the vote is close. Does he contest it in the courts of law? What happens? I think all of the above. I, 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 I know for a fact that both parties, the Democratic and Republican parties have lawyered up. Democrats have lawyers ready to go in 17 states and so do the Republicans. If the race is close, I think Trump will fight it out in the courts and he'll gamble, uh, you know, on, on, uh, you know, methodology questions, uh, uh, disqualification of, of ballots, voter intent, there's numerous legal avenues to challenge. If it's a sweep and if it's a landslide, then he has to make an, a, a decision where the public is going to say, you're down 300 to, you know, 100 and whatever, uh, you're, you're, it's over, you know, and, and the, you know, whether or not he decides not to vacate I'm not sure. I'm not. Uh, I wish I had a. I have an MRI on the on the public, but not on Donald Trump's brain. So I don't know what what he would do. And it really depends on what's going on. But the fact that so many states that Trump won comfortably are still in play is worthy of note, including Georgia, Iowa, Ohio, um, North Carolina, um, and that. Those are data points that we look at, and obviously, you know, that's going to be, you know, resolved. Maybe not election night, but certainly soon thereafter. Hillary four years ago had uh, 66 million votes to Trump's 63 million. Yeah. Trump was the successor in the Electoral College. Um, we already have 80 million people who have voted by mail. Tell me what you think. What 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 gets involved? Some of those. Some of, the, some of our states will allow early counting of, of mail votes. Others choose not to and have allowed counting to take place for as many as three days after the election. Talk about the effect of it. 
Yeah, so it's, it, it's going to impact the sequence of events. You know, as I say, the best night Trump will have is Tuesday night, and he very well could be leading if the states that count mail-in ballots uh, include, you know, a disproportionate Biden voters. We, we, we know that to be a fact. I worry about the change of what happens and the supporters of Donald Trump if he does lose. I mean, if he wins in a landslide, then it's, it's over. If the polls come in, the election results come in, he sweeps the blue wall states, he wins Florida, then the Democrats have to reassess and they have to figure out what they're going to do. But I, I'm looking at the numbers and I've got to take a motion out of it. And the numbers tell me that it's Biden's race to lose. He's in the, he's in the, the best position. Again, it doesn't take into account what might transpire in the next four days. Um, certainly numbers can move. Um, I, I, I think that numbers only move significantly when the undecided is high. It's not. It's only 2 to 4%. So I think you have what you have. And now it's just a question of how many people can vote, how many people will be turned away on election day, how many mail-in ballots will be accepted or discarded. So one of our, one of our listeners is asking, if, if that level of voting is that historic, how do you factor it into the weighting you need to do to come up with the accurate poll results? So what happens is that you can't use just exit polling uh, um, census-based data from 2016 and 2012. And uh, we, everybody models differently. What we tend to do is we then slide the proportions between exit polling likely data and actual census data and resident data because there are some states like New Hampshire where you can be a resident and go vote on election day. You don't need to be registered that day. You just show up, give them your name, you register to vote, and then you vote. So um, uh, in a way, you have to open up uh, the quotas, you know, in terms of the range of the each demographic to allow for the added population. Now, the added population works against Republicans because we did, and we did a poll, Suffolk did a poll of the non-voters in the country. Uh, we published that two years ago in the summer of 2018. And what that poll showed is that the people who don't vote are young, they're disproportionate minority, they're disproportionate disabled as well. A lot of people who don't vote are just plain disabled, they don't vote. Uh, and so if you add that back into the mix, you're looking at a slight advantage to, to Biden. And, and, you, and you're seeing that in some areas that you wouldn't expect, like the suburbs of Philadelphia rather than just Philadelphia County and Delaware County. And so it does have a profound effect, which is why as a rule, general rule, Democrats want more people to participate and cast their ballots. And Republicans want to make sure that only people, the, the people who are eligible to vote are voting and that there isn't uh, you know, any voter fraud going on um, on election day. We have a lot of questions and, 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 and I, I want to get into questions about monies being spent this year versus ever before. And uh, we want to talk about the Senate races as well. A young woman asks, David, what's a landslide? What is it? Both uh, popular as well as electoral votes. What are the indicators of a landslide on election day? Well, technically, we, we, you know, when you get to approaching a double digit lead, a 55 45 lead, you really never get that. I mean, the real landslide in our lifetimes was Barack Obama 2008. I mean, he broke all records. He got 70 million votes. Think about that 70 million votes. And there was enthusiasm and there was focus and it was history. And here you're looking at a high turnout election, higher than 2008, and Joe Biden, who lacks enthusiasm. And whose whose you know whose supporters don't feel the way they do about Joe Biden, he potentially could break Barack Obama's record and get more than 70 million votes. In fact, he could get 80 million votes. It's possible, or 75 million votes. And so, and it's so ironic because when you know when you say the name Joe Biden, even in polls, and I monitor a lot of the polls live, you get this casual response when you say how about joe biden favorable or unfavorable eh, favorable it's never yeah it's you know whereas hillary clinton in 2016 they the voters liked her a lot and would stand out in the rain for 10 hours or they disliked her a lot so 
although Biden is less enthusiastic, it's the polarization and the anti-Trump factor out there that's so uh, amped up in, 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 in uh, you know, among likely voters. Another question, do you think Texas is in play? Can the Democrats win Texas? Yes, they can win Texas. It's question is, will they win Texas? Um, you know, I, I suppose if I were asked this about Michigan back in 2016, and I didn't have any polling data uh, because we, we didn't poll Michigan, I would say probably not. Trump's probably not going to win Michigan. Detroit's got a big turnout or whatever. So I'm learning from that experience. I think I, I think about Texas as traditionally Republican. But keep in mind, the vote share of Republicans has declined in, in Texas. Uh, into the low 50s. It used to be a 60%, 58% for a Republican candidate for president, but it's come down a bit. The problem is that there are some people who don't vote, who, who, who may not vote Republican in Texas, also don't vote for the Democrat. They may blank or they may vote third party. And so as a result, Democratic candidates traditionally, this year is an, ex an exception, but traditionally only get 30, 43, 44, 45 percent. So that it's a bit of a climb to get from 45 to 50. It, it can be done, but it's not something I bet the house on. You touched on this before, the violence, the violence in Philadelphia over the last few days, what effect has that had on the outcome? Has it hurt Biden or has it hurt both? Yeah, that, that's, that's I, I don't really know the answer to that because we don't have polling data on it. There are two events that we really don't have polling data on. That's one of, one of them because we would have to have fielded a poll immediately after. And if anybody's done that, it will be released on Monday. And some major newspapers won't carry polls on election day that are released or even on the Monday before election day. So there's lack of adequate information, you know, in terms of that. The second part uh, is that in terms of the uh, confirmation of Amy Barrett, um, we don't really know from the polling whether or not people are going to vote Biden for president, but then fear the packing of the Supreme Court and may vote Republican senator, or they'll vote Biden for president and go Biden, uh, go Democrat for Senate. Biden's not the type of character that that you would think has long coattails. Um, and he's just trying to get over the finish line himself. But again, Trump being so polarizing, um, you know, he may be the catalyst for a coattail effect that, you know, um, maybe not, uh, that, that might not have been planned on. So are there more lasting shifts? Let me go back to Texas. Are there more lasting shifts in play around this country? Texas, as an example, we say Beto almost beat Senator Cruz in 18, 2018, and Biden is now close, and, and the Dems have a, a real shot at having success in Texas. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think so. I mean, you know, it's, it's possible. Let's put it that way. It's possible. But, you know, ultimately, I, I look at Texas, and I, you know, and I, I just look at what Democrats get traditionally in Texas, you know. Mm -hmm. And to me, that's a that's going to be a tough slog. You know, it's going to be a tough slog. Um, right now, Trump in the Real Clear Politics average, as of three o'clock today, has a two point six average lead in Texas. So that's not a lot. It's three points. It's certainly you've seen many states move three or four points. Uh, but if Texas does go Democrat, then you're going then this election is going to be transformational. You had 08 as a transformational election. 2012 was very good for Barack Obama, but not with the kind of excitement. Uh, you know, you have Donald Trump coming in, and now you're potentially looking at a Democrat winning Texas. I mean, the fact that Biden's even within three points right now, this late, tells you a little bit about the nature of what's going on. Talk about the Senate, Dave, if, if you don't mind. Uh, what do you see? Um, what are the results going to be if you can start from that point and work backwards state by state? Yeah, so, I mean, in Maine, of course, you have, um, you know, Susan Collins, who's been a, a senator for many years, Republican, 
uh, being opposed by the Democrat, Sarah Gideon. Um, we polled Maine. The problem for, for Susan Collins is, is um, ranked choice voting. And just a, a quick primer on ranked choice voting. Instead of voting for one person in Maine, you select in order of all of the candidates your ranking. You rank somebody one, there's four candidates on the Maine ballot for Senate. So it's one, two, three, four. If your candidate is a third party or an independent candidate, you don't lose that vote. That's your first choice. Your second choice would then get the vote. And so your vote would be rotated to the next choice until somebody got 50%. The whole idea is that a majority elects in Maine. Uh, the Democrats gonna do really well because Susan Collins has lost a little bit of cachet and trust among independents. And so she's in a real fight. According to the Real Clear Politics average, that race is uh, dead even. It's a toss up. Uh, in North Carolina, you've got Cunningham, who's challenged, uh, you know, who's running against Senator Tom Tillis, the Republican. Cunningham has had some personal issues that were a little bit embarrassing. He seems to have gotten, uh, you know, his footing back. Uh, the Real Clear Politics average, again, that's close, has him winning by two points. So that's, you know, that's, that's definitely competitive. In Georgia, you've got uh, 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 Senator Perdue, the Republican. Um, he is in a dead heat right now with John Ossoff. John Ossoff ran unsuccessfully for Congress in, in, in Georgia. Uh, you know, so that is a dead heat as well. In, uh, in Iowa, you've got Greenfield, the Democrat, running against Senator Joni Ernst, the Republican. Greenfield has a slight lead there in, in Iowa. She's been on the ropes the entire campaign. I've seen leads of five or six points. She's kind of closed the gap late. Um, so that will be potentially, potentially, uh, another pickup for Democrats. Democrats will lose in Alabama. Uh, Tommy Tuberville, um, who's the Republican, uh, is going to be uh, Senator Jones, the Democrat, by a sizable margin. He leads by 10 points there. So that'll be a, that'll be a loss for Democrats. Uh, Cornyn uh, looks like he'll prevail in Texas. Uh, out West, you've got Mark Kelly. And again, Arizona being so competitive for Biden. Uh, you know, you've got an, you know, he's an astronaut. He appeal, appeals to moderates, uh, potentially will upset Senator uh, uh, McSally. Uh, who's the Republican. So that potentially is a pickup as well. Um, where else? Uh, Danes in Montana looks, uh, the Republican looks pretty strong. Um, he's up by 3%, but you know, he's got a, he's got a pretty good challenge going on there. That's just kind of a, a quick and dirty um, round the horn look at, uh, at the different Senate races. So um, uh, it's, it's definitely worth, uh, uh, it's definitely worth a second look because I'm going to be interested in, are there states that Biden is going to win and the Republican senator is going to win? And that takes me back to another poll question from our national poll, which is, do you support expanding the Supreme Court? And many Democrats do not support that. Um, and if progressive Democrats push to expand the Supreme Court, to nine justice, uh, uh, to uh, you know, expand it by six more justices, so that there's a majority, then you potentially have a backlash effect in the next election, in the 2022 election, because the public is majority of the public uh, opposes adding Supreme Court justices or packing the Supreme Court. Would you be surprised if, if Lindsey Graham lost in South Carolina? I, I would be. Uh, I would be. That's, you know, but right now the real clear politics average is it's a toss up. Um, and so he's in the fight of his life. I mean, he'll be there forever if he survives. Uh, but, you know, Donald Trump hasn't done him any favors in the past. Uh, you know, many Republicans are, will attest to that. Um, so, you know, that and, and Georgia, quite frankly, is in play. Not only, you know, you, you've got You've got um, you, you've got an interesting dynamic in Georgia. You know, I, I you talked a little bit about the bellwethers. There's a bellwether. We're going to release a lot of bellwethers on Monday. Uh, 
Mm -hmm. um, because it's Halloween season, I'm going to give the 7-Eleven, uh, the, the, the 7-Eleven. 7-Eleven, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm going to give the O'Neill and Associates seven letter um, uh, folks a trick or a treat. I'm going to give you a treat tonight. I'm actually going to share with you some of the bellwether areas to look at when you're hovering your mouse over different counties on the different state maps. One of the areas you'd mentioned Georgia is a county called uh, Mitchell County in Georgia. And I'm going to, I kind of went through this already, but uh, there's a, um, let me just jump to the bellwethers. So we do these bellwether areas, um, and I'm, I'm just going to share with you some of the some of the areas. Uh, what I do, I have a proprietary formula. I, what what that's a filtering uh, a formula that basically says there are certain counties in a state that when the vote margin is high the state margin is high. When the vote margin is low, the state margin is low. If, if, if a race flips in the bellwether, it flips at the state level. And we found some areas. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with Michigan because Michigan is a key area. And I actually found two in Michigan. I gave you some stats for one. Uh, there's a county called Isabella County and Saginaw County. Look at, look at, look, check this out for Isabella County. Uh, each column, the first column is the bellwether percentage of either the Democrat winning or the Republican winning in the last four presidential elections and the corresponding state margin in, in Michigan. So in 04, you had, you had Isabella 5148 in that county and the statewide vote was exactly 5148. In 08, 5940 Obama, the state was 5741, a much bigger lead. 54-45 in 2012 for, for uh, Obama against Romney, exactly the same, 54-45 at the state. And then when the Republicans won in 2016, the first county I looked at was Isabella. And guess what? Donald Trump won 49-45 uh, in that bellwether, and so did the state, 48-47. to 47. So that's, of the, of the blue wall states, um, that is certainly one to, uh, to take a look at. I can run through all of them, but uh, I'm sure you have other questions. But if you have specific states that you're interested in as a bellwether, I'm happy to toggle through and see if we've done it for you. Uh, some, there was a question on, on bellwether in, uh, in the state of Florida on, yeah. on, the, on the presidential race. Yeah. So the bellwether that I'm using, I could only find one. Some states we have three or two. Pinellas County. Pinellas County for Florida is the county to watch when election returns come in. You see it on the map. It's the Tampa St. Petersburg area. It's, it's a weird county, right? It's, it's not the Panhandle and it's not Miami. It's just, you know, it's kind of in the middle on the western side. Look at these numbers. Now, Florida has gone twice for Democrats in the, with the D circle in blue and twice for Republicans with the elephant. And every time Pinellas County flips, so does the state of Florida. In 04, Kerry won the state 52-47. Well, guess what? Pinellas had Kerry winning in, uh, mm -hmm. in Pinellas County. You can see 08, uh, 2012, then when it flipped to uh, Trump in 2016, 49-48, it was exactly right. That's what the state ended up. So if you're going to be looking at some early returns, that's the county to be looking at according to the, the history. Now, Pinellas County could come back for Trump and Biden could win Florida. And in that case, that bellwether disqualifies itself from future consideration in 2024. Go back, go back to uh, the earlier part of your, of your presentation on COVID. The effect that it's having on this presidential race, uh, the spiking and the effect that it's having on Trump voters. Um, and, and there's a question about the way Trump campaigns uh, to open very enlarged crowds together without social distancing, without masks, uh, downplaying, dr dramatically downplaying the effects of COVID in the American society today. 
is he, I know we, we know that he's trying to strengthen and talk to his base, but what effect is it having with his electorate? So there, there has been this narrative, and I've seen this uh, out there on, on TV and on blogs and so on, that Biden is making a tactical mistake by not doing rallies. And I can tell you from the poll we released today, that's absolutely not true. People, when we're asking their comfort level and their support level, they do not support these large rallies, especially when people are not using masks uh, that Donald Trump is holding. And a majority of people are saying that they believe Biden's strategy of not holding large rallies uh, because of the coronavirus is the proper strategy. And more people agree with that. So that one finding pretty much in my mind, eliminates the possibility that, I think that's more insider stuff. I think that's more, you know, in the weeds type of analysis of, among the general population, you know, obviously it's being impacted greatly. Uh, it, doesn't, it doesn't hold water. This is a job approval of President Trump. On the left, you have a circle of, of approve, strongly approve and approve, and it's 44 approve and 53 combined disapprove. And on the right side, you can see, you know, Trump has great numbers when it comes to the economy, even today, 48 approval, 45 disapproval. But here's where the race is lost to your, to your uh, uh, question. 38% only, 38% approve of Donald Trump's uh, handling of the coronavirus, almost six in 10, 57% disapprove. So there was, a, there, was, there was another question here about the way Joe Biden has been campaigning. There, there's, a, there's a belief that Joe has been hunkering down at his home in, in, in Delaware and that he hasn't been out campaigning. And has that hurt him? What you're saying is your numbers belie that. What they say is they approve of the way he's, he's conducting his campaign. Not only of the way he's conducting his campaign, but his decision not to hold rallies. Because the public, or what we're reading from that is the public sees that it's a health threat. It may be great in the moment, it may be great for TV, it may be great for the morale of the Republican Party, but there are potentially going to be casualties. People are going to get sick, and it happened to President Trump himself and his staff. A lot of, a lot of people uh, ha had to do what most people who get the virus do, which is to take care, to quarantine, in some cases to be hospitalized, and to try and survive it. And I think there's, there was wisdom in that poll finding uh, where people are saying, you know, with the way technology is and the way we're functioning without doing a lot of in-person interaction, I agree with Joe Biden's methodology. It's, it's, better, it's better for him and it's better for the people who would be at risk. There's yet another question about Bill Weathers. And this one um, is focusing in on Pennsylvania. What's the Bill Weather or Bill Weathers you have in Pennsylvania? David. Yeah. So, yeah, I believe it's Northampton, but yeah, there it is. So uh, Northampton is the bellwether in Pennsylvania. Now, it's not Allegheny County. It's certainly not Philadelphia County, but this is a county that's got about 300,000 people. Um, and when you look at what happened in Pennsylvania, and Pennsylvania is going to, going to be a lot of eyes on it, it really, not only did it vote Democrat correctly in 04, 08, and 12, but it had a remarkable accuracy in 2012. It was exactly correct in terms of the state. And it had Trump winning by a margin of 50 to 46. And as you know, he won the state 48 to 47. So the fact that it picked that up and, and flipped and the state flipped at the same time suggests to me that that's a county to keep your eye on. You know, just uh, non-Bellweather related, it, it does seem to me that when Hillary four years ago kind of took the race for granted and chose not to go into the, you know, into the blue states to reinforce her own base and giving the feelings people that she was taking them and in, in their votes for granted, uh, it hurt her. It really did hurt her. Now, Joe Biden, who has been hunkering down, does choose to go out of his, of his, of his, uh, of his home and campaigns in Georgia not in Pennsylvania, not in Wisconsin, not in Michigan. Tell me why. Because he's on offense. Right now he has leads in those states that you mentioned. Uh, uh, he, he'll deploy Kamala Harris and, and others to those other states. 
uh, because he it, maybe his own polling has has it uh, on the cusp of being outside the margin of error in some of the polling, and he's campaigning in a state where that he has no business winning, Georgia, um, and you know, it, it, and as I say, you know, when you look at um, when you look at Georgia, you've also got to consider that Democrats have gone up significantly in over time in Georgia. So, you know, I mean, it, it, you know, we, we try to keep all of that in, you know, in, a, in the back of our head. But if you look at this uh, edge, now Republicans have won uh, four straight times, right, in Georgia. But look at the number come down from 2012 to 2016, now we're at 2020. So you have, you have Romney with 53% in 2012. Two years, uh, four years later, Trump only got 51%. The Democrats stayed at 46, so that wasn't good on the Democratic side, but the Republican number was coming down. And if the trend continues, it suggests that this is a close race, and it is. According to Real Clear Politics, Georgia is a dead heat. That's why I think having these added tools like bellwethers to look at will help relieve some of the stress and anxiety when you're uh, looking at how counties uh, vote and what impact they may have on the state. Well, as I say, it's not 100% proof. We're probably going to release Monday 13 to 15 bellwethers. I don't expect them all to be right, but I do expect a majority of them to be right. And if the statistics historically are, are any uh, guide, it'll probably be 11 or 12 will be right in terms of predicting the state outcomes out of 15. Fascinating. David, I want you to talk about the money collected, especially on the part of the Democrats, not only in the Biden campaign, but for, for uh, congressional campaigns, Senate campaigns, and even lower, lower ballot, down ballot campaigns where people are getting money. Over $16 billion has been collected by the Democrats this year. That's up almost double or triple what it was four years ago. Um, in the presidential race itself, six and a half billion dollars has been spent and almost 65 or 70 percent of that has gone to Biden and not Donald Trump. Yeah, uh, I mean Donald Trump got outspent in 2012 as well, Hillary Clinton, uh, 2016, Hillary Clinton outraised them. But to your point, I mean, and you've got a transformation of how people donate now too. So uh, you don't, obviously due to COVID, you don't have these you know, cocktail parties where you're spending half your budget on the event and you're making some money for the candidate or the candidate's party. Uh, and you also have, because of Bernie Sanders, quite frankly, you have an increase of people who are young, who aren't making millions of dollars, but who are used to giving $25 again in 25, another 25. And they don't know it at the time they're donating, but at the end of the line, they're gonna probably donate 500 bucks or, or, or thereabouts for, for a candidate. That's a gold mine. That person is a gold mine, especially if they you know, feel passionately about a cause or a particular candidate. Um, so I think you have that added dynamic and that's not the only reason why the fundraising coffers have gone up. You also have super PACs and you have more people at the table in addition to the regular PAC and institutional communities like labor unions and so on, you've got a lot of other uh, folks who are even interested in third party uh, participation for different, different races. Um, and it's basically a free for all. It's great for Facebook and it's great for TV uh, buys, TV stations. They always do terrific um, during elections. Um, but in the end, I mean, I think you have a situation where no matter what you say in a political advertisement, mm -hmm. you have to calibrate who you're targeting and what the message is. Mm -hmm. And sometimes even if you have an extra 50 or $100 million, I mean, you have two known quantities here, the undecided is low. I mean, I know from my own polling, if I was gonna target un, you know, undecideds, I'd be targeting independents, I would be targeting women and young, voters because traditionally those are category and casual voters that is people who say that they're only 50 50 to vote or somewhat likely to vote versus i've already voted or i'm very likely to vote 
And so, you know, people who are at a higher pay grade than I am, um, who are internally d directing campaigns based on their polling are saying, this is a waste of time and money. These people are already decided. They've got to find the categories uh, in the crosstabs that are 8% undecided instead of four or 10% undecided instead of four, and then have a targeted strategy to convince those folks to either get out and vote or to persuade them to vote. A couple of other questions. Is South Carolina in the Senate seat really a toss up fight? I, th I think it is. I mean, you know, one of the dangers is when you're, when you're analyzing is to put too much weight on history. Uh, and I touched on this earlier in the talk. Um, I know so many other pollsters who are footnoting and clarifying and talking around what they really know in the numbers, what I know in the numbers. And I can't be fearful of that. Mm -hmm. uh, at the same token, you know, that, that seat the numbers show that it's a dead heat. I mean, that's what the numbers show. Now, those I didn't poll it, but there are there are there are some polls out there that are pretty good polls that show the race dead even. So I do believe um, you've got to follow the numbers and you've got to take fear out of the equation. You got to report the numbers. And as I say, you know, Trump could overperform all of the polls that are out there, but he could also underperform too. Uh, and Biden could be doing better in the polling, uh, even the polling that's out there. So, uh, you know, our job is no matter what, what the result is, we have to put it out there. We want other researchers and other people to examine it, criticize it, go through it with a fine tooth comb. You'll find that Suffolk University, we publish all of our cross tabs online. It's not just 20 pages, it's 200 pages. I mean, I think the last poll we released was almost 300 pages of cross tabulation data. So any geek who loves numbers like, like Tom and I do, loves this kind of thing. And you can pour over it for hours. You probably will never sleep a wink, but you pour over the numbers because you can find little nuggets of opportunity if you really read deep into the cross tabs. So we've got, we've got a group of people who are listening to you. Um, what should they be looking for on Tuesday night? For the, for the early signals as to what's going to happen, rather yeah. than wait 12 hours or two days for, for the final election results? Well, the first thing I would say is don't be anxious, don't be stressed out. Um, life will go on whether Trump or Biden wins, uh, but be, be kind to polls that you don't agree with and try to understand if there are trends in line. Uh, John King from CNN and others are going to try and help us uh, look at overperformance or underperformance in certain counties. I would say, you know, keep an eye out for the counties that I release on Monday if you want to have fun and, uh, and see whether or not some of these counties were way off or if they were indicators in some way. Um, but I would start, the short answer to your question is I would start with the three blue wall states first because if Biden wins those, it's pretty much over at that point. Florida doesn't matter. Now, unfortunately for all of us, Michigan, you know, doesn't count their mail-in ballots. So we're not gonna know Michigan, although the lead in Michigan is significantly high. Um, the, then you'd go fall back to the second tier after you look at the blue wall states. The second tier would be Florida, North Carolina, both Eastern time zone uh, states. Um, and if there is a, a movement in Ohio to Biden or Iowa, then that's another signal that Arizona potentially, Georgia potentially, and maybe even Texas could be, could be part of this wave that, um, you know, that the pollsters are already measuring, but not really talking about. Um, so I would say, try to think about it in tiers. And then, you know, obviously the other states uh, that I haven't mentioned, you would probably want to keep in the mix like Nevada, Colorado, and so on. The Lincoln Project, did it have any effect did the ads they ran have any effect on this on this campaign? I, I mean, I don't think so. I mean, I, I when people ask me the cause and effect questions, I always I always settle on the undecideds, and this is an unusual race. I think this year Suffolk's had probably the lowest amount of undecideds in this race than we normally do. 
um, f not only for a presidential, but any race, Massachusetts, midterm, national. Um, and so any event, I think, has a minimal impact, including the Lincoln Project. It also including the fact that you've got so many people who have voted already. Uh, think about that. I mean, if 10% of the country used to vote by absentee ballot or in-person voting, you have 90% who could be swayed right up until election day. You don't have that. I mean, you've got, you say 80 million, I think it's going to be 90 or 100 million people by election day that are going to have already voted. That's a most, big number, 90 million. And most of those people who have voted, voted when Joe Biden was a much stronger candidate, doing better in the polls than he's even doing today. Yeah. He was in double digits. I mean, uh, I, do I think Biden is going to win by 10 points? No, I don't think I would bet on that. But there are some polls that at a particular speck in time when they were out in the field, he might have had one of those mini surges. It's like when you look at your, you know, a, a, a blood pressure chart or some medical chart and you see that little spike that goes up. It doesn't measure your 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 average health condition. It's just that little spike up that's a that's a little bit of a signal. And so you kind of analyze it for what it is. Um, and, and there are times when Biden dropped. I remember, and Tom and I have talked about this a lot, you know, Biden historically has been a poor debater. And during the primary, the Democratic primary, every time we polled after a Democratic debate, Biden's numbers dropped. And I remember saying to Tom, at some point, Biden's going to just break even in a debate or maybe even exceed expectations. And then what's going to happen? And that's kind of what happened in the first debate. Nobody expected him to do very much of anything in that first debate. And he did fairly well. He got very high marks actually in the second debate also. So, you know, I mean, these are the kinds of things that, that we look at in terms of, you know, how undecideds are impacted and what the relevance of particular events or projects will have on the, on the ultimate vote. I would be more worried about uh, at this point, I wouldn't be worried about events or advertisements that impact undecided voters. I would be more worried about thousands of mail-in ballots lost or destroyed, uh, thousands of people turned away at the polls. Um, that could have a significant impact on the mm -hmm. outcome, where a pollster will be blamed for having a bad poll for calling it wrong, when in fact he was polling or she was polling people who were turned away at the poll uh, on election day. So you can blame a pollster, you know, in a, in a state like that. But ultimately, you know, if someone gets turned away, uh, that's a likely voter for whatever reason in that particular state, that, that does impact the process. And, you know, we suffer the consequences of that, but that's certainly part of the game. So I have two questions, both around predictability and on outcomes. How do you see the Senate race turning out? How many, how many, what's the change yeah, going to be? I, I think, well, as I say, Alabama is a goner for the Democrats. So Republicans have that, but I think there are at least four or potentially five other pickup. I mean, I think you could see a 52-48 Senate. I know that sounds crazy to some people. For the Democrat. Uh, I mean, uh, for the Democrat, yeah. Uh, and you'll see a flip where Republicans will, you know, just aren't going to do well, even if they split out some of the, uh, the uh, toss-ups. Um, at this point, unless that one dynamic is in play, which is people who are on the fence or independents who vote for Biden to get Trump out, don't want packing or don't, or don't want to give it all away to one party, may come back and counter vote or Republican. I don't know if people are that sophisticated, but, you know, sometimes ticket balancing does happen in some states under some conditions. So, you know, uh, that's a tough prediction to make, but you know, at this point, from the numbers I see today, not in four days, Democrats look uh, pretty uh, poised to take the Senate as well. You, you know, David, you talked about the fact that, that Joe Biden has been campaigning on the offensive. Um, Donald Trump has been campaigning then on the defensive. I mean, he's, he's trying to shore up his base everywhere he goes, and he's not, he's not venturing out the way Joe Biden has, uh, number one. Talk to us about the message points Biden has as well as Trump. Why has, why has Biden been overly concerned about COVID and Donald Trump not mentioning it, not mentioning any other things that would have been 
far greater, uh, far more important to play who was on base. Yeah, I mean, it's all, it's easy to play Monday morning quarterback and the game's not over yet. So it's, it, maybe it isn't Monday morning yet. But uh, I, I think Donald Trump really never, if he, if he truly felt that, that either there wasn't anything that could be done or create a timeline and do a political ad and try to convince the people who right now in polls are telling us that Trump's you know, job performance on coronavirus is almost 60% disapprove. And people are dying every day. And we all know people who've gotten coronavirus. Some people we know have died of coronavirus. So it's that, that's not a myth. I mean, people are getting sick and people are dying and we're all working from home pretty much. So, you know, it is a reality. Um, and he, you know, he wanted to downplay COVID and talk about the economy. The economy is a winning issue. If you take COVID-19 off the table this year, Donald Trump's a pretty hard candidate to beat. What's the reason you, you, you vote him out besides the fact that he tweets a lot? The economy has been roaring. Uh, it would continue to roar probably uh, without COVID-19. Uh, you know, he, his positions on healthcare, racism and other uh, issues are, are not good. Uh, for the general population, but he'd, he'd be at least a much more competitive candidate. But with COVID-19, as I say, you know, people in their own houses are doing much better personally when you say, you know, you're better off or not personally mm -hmm. through their 401ks or whatever, but they're not because you've got this storm outside, you know, in the, in the form of COVID-19 that's, you know, drenching out any other, uh, 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 accomplishments that President Trump can put out there. And, and that's, that's really hastened the decision-making process for Biden and against Trump. Your bellwether uh, survey analysis around the country, this is the last question, who wins the presidency of the United States? Uh, today, I would say Joe Biden. Uh, on election day, probably Joe Biden. I wouldn't say definitely Joe Biden, but I would say probably Joe Biden wins next Tuesday. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, I, I, again, as I wrote in my column today, as a, forget being a pollster, as a citizen, I, I hope that we have whoever wins, doesn't matter. We need to come together and we need uh, uh, people to feel good about being an American again and to, you know, be open to other people's points of view. And uh, the fact that that poll shows a fear of violence being so high by all the viewers of different TV stations and races and gender and all of the demographics was very, uh, it was a very chilling consistency. And uh, I would encourage you to check out that article. Thank you very much, uh, David. You were great tonight as usual. Uh, we look forward to talking to you right after the election and find Perfect. out what, what your take is then. I want to thank everybody that came and, and joined us for the program tonight. And uh, a reminder, we're going to be uploading this to, uh, to uh, YouTube, and we're going to put it out as a podcast as well. So tell your family and friends if they've missed this, that's where they can get it. David, a million thanks on behalf of the folks at the Boston Harbor Hotel, Seven Letter, and O'Neill and & Associates. Can I simply say you're a great friend? Say hello to Gail. And enjoy mm -hmm. these last few days before the election. Thank you. And thanks for all the great questions, everybody. Bye-bye.